G'day, Chris here and welcome back to ClickSpring. It's central to virtually everything we do in the home shop, so it's no surprise at all that selecting the right lathe is easily one of the biggest decisions to be made during the whole shop setup process. It's not easy to know exactly what it is you really need in a first lathe, and the range of choices is overwhelming. So in this video, I'm going to talk about a few of the things worth considering when selecting that first lathe. Now you'll notice that I'm deliberately excluding the good quality old iron from the discussion, like for example second-hand Myfords and South Bends. Whether it be for reasons of budget or geography, most of us starting out have limited purchase options, so I'm keeping the focus on the machines that are accessible. Okay, so with that in mind, I think there are three criteria that can be used to immediately narrow the field of choices. Cost, space, and what are you planning to make? Naturally, you can only spend what you have in the budget, but as I mentioned in TGT number four, on top of the cost of the actual machine, the budget also needs to extend to all of the tooling you'll need to do something useful with it, like tailstock accessories, cutting tools, and maybe a quick change tool post. So keep that in mind too. The space requirement is not just about the footprint of the machine, but also about the extra space you need around it to comfortably use it. You're going to want to get in behind the machine to clean up chips, you'll need occasional access for maintenance, and most importantly, you'll need to be able to comfortably access this area to access the change gears, maybe change pulley settings and run overlength stock through the headstock. I'd allow at least a couple of feet to the left of the headstock to make this easy. Okay, so with those two criteria alone, you've probably cut the field down to a manageable number and you've likely identified the maximum size lathe you can both fit in your space and afford to buy. So the choice now comes down to what is it that you plan to make? How long and wide are the largest parts that you intend to work with? In what way will the lathe be required to hold them? And keep in mind all of the tool making projects that you're likely to want to tackle as well, beyond the main projects, because there's a fair chance that they might be the limiting factor in your lathe choice. Now there are four specifications on a lathe that immediately stand out as the primary limitations. The spindle bore, the swing over the carriage, the swing over the bed, and the bed length. The first number is fairly straightforward. That's the maximum diameter of rodstock that will freely pass through the spindle. So anything with a larger diameter and you'll need to cut the stock to length with a small chucking allowance, which inevitably wastes a little material. Or if it's a long part, the limitation might mean that you need to run it out on a steady rest to put in the features, instead of being able to chuck it normally. The swing over the bed and the bed length are the two parameters by which lathes are generally identified. A 9x20 lathe, for example, can in theory accommodate a 9 inch diameter part over a 20 inch long bed. Now one or more of these parameters will likely be a limiting factor for the projects that you'd like to tackle. Take for example clock making, where most of the parts are fairly short, so bed length is rarely a limiting factor. But the swing over the bed is certainly a limiting factor on the largest clock wheel that can be cut, which in turn limits the size of the clock projects that can be attempted. It's also worth keeping in mind the small parts that you intend to make too. You can certainly make small parts on a larger lathe, but the feel through the hand wheels on a small lathe is so much lighter and delicate, and it really does influence the way that you make the cuts. So while you do want to give yourself a bit of room at the upper end of the machine's capabilities, and it is tempting to just go for the biggest lathe that you can afford, the scale of the machine should match the scale of the parts that you intend to make. Okay, so now let's have a closer look at a few of the features that are worth paying attention to. And to kick things off, this is one that rarely gets discussed, but I think is essential. Because if you'd like to use the lathe for cross-slide milling operations, like for example wheel cutting, then the most convenient way to make that happen is by mounting everything on the cross-slide with T-slots. If the lathe doesn't have T-slots, then you'll have to invent an alternative solution, so keep it in mind. Now you probably don't need too much encouragement from me on this one. A quick change tool post pretty much recommends itself. But what I wanted to mention is that they often can require a bit of work to fit. The red lathe required a new post and a small amount of machining done on the tool holders to bring the cutting tool down to centre height. For the blue lathe, this post will need to be pushed out and a bit of work done to fit a new one. Now it's all fairly straightforward if you've got the other machines like a mill and so on all sorted out. But not so much if this is your first big purchase, so again, keep it in mind. The work on modifying this assembly will make a good project video, so my quick fix for now is to just swap out the whole assembly for the spare SC4 top slide that was once fitted to the green lathe. Ok, in my experience this is the great weakness of the import lathes, and it's a difficult one to properly fix. 
So I'd suggest when you've got it down to a short list, be sure to do some serious digging on this subject to see what other owners have to say about their machines. It does seem as though the larger machines are less prone to the issue, and my own experience bears that out. The blue lathe isn't perfect, but it's streets ahead of the red lathe, and really the only difference is size. It's bigger, wider and heavier, and that seems to make all of the difference. In any event, it's going to really bug you if you get a weak tailstock, so do some homework and see what you can find out about the machine that you've got your eye on. Soon after I purchased the red lathe, I noticed a slight shimmer pattern on the facing cuts, and it turns out that what I was seeing was a very light radial wave pattern being generated by the gear noise travelling down the spindle. The impact of each tooth meshing with its counterpart was actually printing on the work. Now it's common enough to have been reported in even the best quality gear driven lathes, so it's not fair to blame the lathe necessarily. But a pulley driven lathe doesn't exhibit this behaviour, and is generally much quieter when running, so that might be something worth considering. The red lathe has an unhardened bed, and the bed of the blue lathe is hardened and ground. Personally, I think a hardened bed is fairly important. It'll extend the lifespan of the machine, and also give a small measure of protection against those moments when you inevitably drop something on the bed. Now it's not an option for the Sherline, but it is usually an option with some of the larger import machines. You'll probably only care about this one if you have a regular need to cut left hand threads. The blue lathe has a reversible lead screw mechanism as standard, so it's ready to go. The red lathe requires the manual swap of a gear and spacer in the gear train, so it's a little less convenient, but it's still capable. And most import machines will fall into one or the other of these two situations. The Sherline is a little different, with a dedicated thread cutting attachment, which as it happens can also produce a left hand thread. I've never used it, but I'll put a link to it in the text below. This one is definitely worth considering. Each of my machines has a different mechanism to achieve the result, but the most interesting method is certainly this one. It does a great job of keeping the chips out of the lead screw thread so that they don't clog it up. Ok, so the point that I'd like to make here is that occasionally an opportunity presents to get additional use out of some components based on your choice of machines. For example, I chose a lathe and mill both with a number 3 Morse taper spindle, so that I could share collets and a single collet chuck between them. Now it's not a huge deal, but it does simplify things just a little, and it might end up saving you a few dollars. Another example is the fact that the Sherline can be used as a milling and drilling attachment on the cross slide of a larger lathe, effectively doubling its role in the shop. So keep an eye out for these sorts of opportunities. They just might swing a decision in a particular direction. In this regard the Sherline is excellent, but the two import lathes leave a lot to be desired. And for clock making that's a bit of a problem because most clock makers use the rear of the spindle bore for mounting division equipment. Now it is fixable. It takes a bit of time to get it right, but an eccentric load can be formed on the insert so that it counteracts the eccentricity. There's no good reason why this runout couldn't be much better, so I think it's fair to assume that some of the manufacturers just don't realise how important this part of the lathe is to some of us, and things are unlikely to change until they do. So be on alert for this if it's something that you really need. Changing out chucks is a relatively common event, and it's something that you want to get done as quickly as possible. The Sherline is a breeze, the red lathe a little less so, but the blue lathe much less so again. In this case, the gap behind the spindle is just too tight. It's about half of what it really should be to allow comfortable access to the fasteners. Now, it's not a huge deal I guess, it just adds a bit of time to the task, but it's little things like this that can really get on your nerves over time. Both of the imports and the Sherline are variable speed. And just for the convenience that it brings, I'd class this as an essential feature. The blue lathe is the one that you won't have seen much of at this point, so here's a bit more detail of how that works. It's super smooth and surprisingly quiet. In fact, I think the cooling fan might be louder than the actual motor. And finally, I'd class this as an essential feature too. The Sherline is of course all manual, and the range of the machine is fairly limited, so a power crossfeed doesn't really seem necessary. But the other two machines can potentially chuck a very large surface, and you would definitely notice the difference in the surface finish between hand fed and power fed on that scale. So if it's possible to get a power crossfeed in the machine that you're considering, then I'd suggest definitely do so. 
Now one thing I haven't mentioned is how important leveling is to the lathe performance. All lathes need to be properly leveled before use. And that term is a little unfortunate because it sounds like I'm talking about making something horizontal, when really what I'm talking about is taking the twist out of the lathe bed. Straight out of the packing crate, all of these lathes will have a light twist to the bed and so are turning some sort of taper. The bed needs to be straightened out or leveled so that it then turns a true cylinder. Now there are plenty of videos out there showing the process and I'll put some links in the notes below. But one thing worth pointing out is that most of those videos show big heavy lathes being leveled, or more correctly twisted, by simply jacking up one corner of the lathe stand from the floor. An alternative approach to consider for these smaller benchtop machines is to lightly shim directly underneath the feet of the bed, and then crank down on the fasteners to generate the force required to twist the bed straight. Now it's easy enough to do, and it gives the required results, but don't be surprised if you spend a few days getting this right, it is a bit of a time consuming process. So to answer the main question, my suggestion is this. Filter through the options I've just discussed and find the machine that best suits your needs. But don't put off the decision for too long. Just make a choice and run with it. Even if it's not your ideal machine, the main thing is to get started learning and having some fun making chips. Thanks for watching. I'll see you later.